All right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started then. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Sandy Risberg, and I'm an instructor here in the College of Education. In, uh, primarily, I, as far as instructor goes, I am in, in the secondary um, side of the world. I am the block one, one of the block one instructors or core methods. But I also am the coordinator of our Military Connected Student Education Program. And what we did here at Kansas State in the College of Ed was we joined a nationwide program called Educate the Educators. And it's under the Joining Forces programs that are designed to help train pre-service, like yourselves, educators, and in-service educators, so all of those teachers that you're going to be out there and working in their classrooms and uh, <coughs> be one someday, to train them on the, the culture of the military child and give them some strategies and best practices on working with our military kids in the classroom. Um, so why is this important? There is, there are military connected students in every school district in the United States. Does that surprise anybody? Doesn't surprise you? Okay, so how would you define military connected? Do I have any military connected individuals in here? I thought, okay, what's your connection? Well, I'm just former military. You're, okay, so you're a veteran. Okay, great. Are you talking about like if our family is military? Yeah, if your family. Um, my uncle's a general. Your uncle's a general. Okay. Great. Any other military connections? No? So this is going to be new to a lot of you. And we have a couple people who, who are, one, very familiar with the military lifestyle and, and one who's been exposed to it through family connections. So we have active duty, reserves, guards. We have all of our veterans as the military over the last 12 years. Um, has been such a high tempo and now we're kind of drawing out of those conflicts. The military in general is drawing down and those, those service, a lot of service members are moving out into the um, <coughs> communities as civilians now, suddenly civilian, I like to call them. And, and so you're going to have those kids who've had these experiences um, in, in your classrooms. The districts like the ones we have here locally that operate around uh, military installations have a lot of support systems. There's a lot of programs, there's a lot of uh, information easily available to the teachers. But for those of you, when you move out, I don't expect, how many of you expect to teach right here in the Manhattan Junction City area? Okay, <coughs> one <laughs> out of 20 <laughs> is not a very high percentage. Right, so you're going to spread across the country and you may not be in an area, even though you may have military kids, that has a, um, an installation nearby. So how do you, as a teacher, meet the needs? Um, and what are the special challenges and benefits uh, that military kids have? And how do you meet the needs in your classroom? And that's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes. Um, right here at Fort Riley, since you will be spending quite a bit of time in our Fort Riley area schools um, during your training here through the College of Ed, wanted to give you a little bit of information about Fort Riley. We have almost 20,000 soldiers stationed at Fort Riley. Does that surprise anybody? Because 20,000 soldiers come with a lot of family members, <laughs> 26,000 family members. And 70% of them live in the local communities. Does that, is that crazy? Does that really surprise you? Yeah, it is a very high number. Um, 3,500 students attend school on post. How many of you have been out to the elementary schools? We have five elementary schools on post, quite a few of you, OK. And, or six elementary schools on post, sorry, and a middle school. The rest of them go to the surrounding <coughs> public schools. We also have um, another 1,000 retirees and civilian employees that are also military connected. So there's over 60,000 people just in our own local community um, that are military connected. So how would it feel to walk in the shoes um, of a military family member? How many of you had the opportunity to watch the documentary? I heard a couple of you say, quite a few of you. Um, we have... Um, the, I was going to show you the trailer here. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to be someone else? To actually see the world through their eyes? That is why we created the documentary series, A Walk in My Shoes. And now we present our latest installment, Military Life. Because great teaching starts with good listening, we went straight to subject matter experts military members and their families at Fort Riley and Fort Leavenworth and ask what they wish teachers knew about their lives. 
Stories highlight the dedication, the bonds, the service, and the challenges our military and their families face. It is our hope that by sharing their experiences, we can provide invaluable insights for our pre-service teachers, learn from each other, and recognize the good that each student brings to our campus, and, in a way, walk in someone else's shoes. That sense of serving something greater and being a part of something large that everybody has an equal share in, that camaraderie and that friendship is something that you just can't really describe or put words to, but a military person kind of understands it. And that's why you form such a strong bond with your brothers in arms. You have to get through it together and uh, you work for that one common goal, you know, just getting home alive. This is all I've ever known was the military life. Very patriotic family. We believe in our country and giving back. Growing up as a military kid, I'm glad that I'll have that background. That way, I'll be able to relate to the students and know exactly how they feel because I know a lot of times you're looking at a teacher and you say, well, you don't understand. One of the things that I want my children's teachers to know is that we do have a very unique lifestyle. It's not bad, it's just different, um, very different. And unless you've been a part of it, it's hard to understand some of those challenges. I think the best part of military life for me as a spouse and a parent has been the opportunity for constant growing and changing myself. I was very surprised to find out the number of our students who are impacted by the military. I didn't understand the sacrifices that those children make along with mom and dad and their siblings and their entire family. One thing I wish that some teachers would be is, is maybe a little more empathetic. When you're in the United States, it's not as easy to understand the difficulties of a parent being deployed. Okay, so let's talk about the culture of the military. <coughs> What, what is culture? How do you define culture in general? Not, not just military, the, the, the term culture. What does that mean to you? A way of life. A way of life. Background. Background. Traditions. Traditions. What kind of traditions? What's involved in, what's inclusive in traditions? Things that are passed down from generation. Okay, things that are passed down from gener generation to generation. Who can think of a tradition in your own family? We're getting ready to have a holiday. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. What's a Thanksgiving tradition somebody has? My dad makes the turkey. Dad makes the turkey in your family, OK? What else? I heard something over here. Watching football. Watching football. <laughs> Great tradition. No hunters? No hunting? Oh, really? <laughs> my, my family, my, my brother-in-law and, and my, uh, it, yeah, they're out hunting. They're sitting in a tree at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> All right. What else is there involved in a culture? Language? Music? Dress. Dress. Okay. Different celebrations. How about have you ever heard the term subculture? Yes. Okay. What what does that bring to mind? What what would you say if you, you what is a subculture? All the little pockets of culture. And the military is one of those subcultures. Because the military is an enormously diverse group of people from many, many different cultures. Just Junction City School District. How many languages do you think are spoken in the Junction City Fort Riley School District? 60. Good job. 57. <laughs> Oh, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say this, this year they counted 57 languages in the Junction City School District. That is diversity. 
Okay. So, but the military in itself, the lifestyle creates a subculture made up of people from all these different cultures. So, what are the benefits of being a military connected child? I'm going to start with my vet. Can I can pick on you for just a second? Do you have kids? No. No kids. Is anybody a military kid? I would think you would have said that when you said military connected. Okay. What do you see and as a vet? Did you see friends who had kids? What was the benefit of, of the military for a child? Well, the benefit, I think, is that it's a really stable job. Like, they always get a house. They always have a place to live. They always have health care. Like, I think health care is, like, the really big thing of why people with families <laughs> Especially to stay in the military. Right. And also the housing thing, because they always have a house, like you can get one on poster off and then you get that paid for. Right. The, you know, so where, what did he, what does all that meet? Think back to your Ed Psych. The safety? Yes. Yeah. Maslow's first <clears throat> hierarchy. Yes, Maslow's hierarchy. And the first level right here is the safety, is the physio, is the, you know, the health, the, the um, house, food, safety, all of those parts, okay, it's physiological um, parts. Okay, what are some other things? I have put a few up on the board. Often, our military kids get the opportunity to travel and live in different countries, live in different states. Um, my own kids have lived in nine different states. And well, yeah, no, they've lived, they've moved 11 times. So I guess they probably lived in 11 different states. Um, they have, uh, get, they get exposed to different languages. They get exposed to different traditions. Um, there's different sports. There's different candy on the shelf in the store. I mean, it's just, it's a little bit different. Um, often our military kids, because they have to move so often, and they do move, about, the, average, the average military child is going to attend between seven and nine schools across their K through 12. Wow. Does that surprise you? I heard a wow. <laughs> uh, my own boys went to seven different schools. Uh, they, and five of those seven different schools were just between sixth grade through 12th grade, just middle school and high school. And of those five different schools, they were in five different states. And dad was deployed for three of those years, of those seven years. Um, so it was um, very, you know, dynamics flowing, constantly changing. When, you, when your middle schooler goes to sixth grade in, I don't even remember where he went, sixth grade in Georgia, seventh grade in California, and eighth grade in Pennsylvania. And they're on different curriculums at the time. What's going to help that? Common Core. Yes. Um, and they were handed the same textbook in seventh grade for social studies that they were given in sixth grade social studies. OK. It happens. So, but our kids learn to adapt quickly. They learn to reach out and, and get involved very quickly in organizations, in teams, in clubs offered by the school. Um, the children often, military kids, are often empathetic to, to the new kids coming in because they've been through it. And they understand that transition is hard. And they're more willing to accept new kids into the classroom. Now, I'm not saying this is every kid because guess what? Military kids are still kids. And there is, these are just some common, common things, but every, there's always individual children who are not going to fit the mold no matter, in, no matter what it is. Um, a, a parent's deployment can also include, um, lead to increased maturity, independence. Often the families rely on um, some of the older children to pick up some of the household chores to help with the, maybe help with their younger siblings or, or do some of the, the household things that um, the other parent who left um, on a deployment or something dealt with. My son right now, I'm, I'm the one who's deployed because my family is actually in Virginia. And so for the last few months, I've been back here at Kansas State. And my oldest son, now he's 23. OK, I did not leave a baby a homo. <laughs> he is 23, and he's graduated from college. He's working on his master's. But he's living with dad. And he has taken on roles that he has never had to do in his life, that stuff I always took care of. 
like getting the mail, not just getting the mail, but now dealing with it and, and what bills there were and things so he knows what he has to give to his dad to take care of or call me about and let me know about. Um, he's doing the grocery shopping, he's doing most of the cooking because my husband's job has very long hours and doesn't get home till 7.30 at night after being you know, at work at seven in the morning. So it's, uh, he's taking on roles even as a 23 year old and I bless him for that. But he's a great military kid and now he's a great military young man. So what about, so those are some of the benefits, but what about some of the challenges? What do you think, what do you see could be challenges? Yes. I grew up in the same small town my whole life and I feel like you lose a little bit of like growing up with the same classmates and building those types of connections. <coughs> like when I was a senior, I had some of those kids when I was in kindergarten. Right. You know, just connections lost over time. It does because of all the moving, it's hard. Um, you know, luckily these days with social media and, and uh, you know, Facebook and Instagram and whatever else is trending these days, Snapchat and <laughs> Twitter, um, our kids are able to keep, my, my own kids personally, I know for a fact, are still in touch with some of their friends from kindergarten. And, and that's been a nice addition to the culture in general of being able to stay connected. But you're right, they don't have those memories together um, of growing up. What else do you, what else do you, comes to mind that you think would be a challenge for military kids? Um, I don't know if this is a challenge, but I have a friend and she works at Fort Riley Middle School and there's always a problem with students bringing like knives or different things like that to school. Okay. And, like growing up, I went to um, elementary school, no, I went to middle school in Lomigo and we never had that problem. Right. But bringing knives and then is that, you got to look at that in, is it in context. Are they bringing knives because it's in their backpack because they were doing something over the weekend or are they bringing knives for malintent? Well, that sometimes that happens, and like I said, kids are kids, and there's probably kids all over the country that, that do that. But um, in some school districts are gonna gonna have more kids who have who, who might do that. What are some other challenges? I feel like even though that they may have the stability of always having a house or always having <coughs> like you know a place to live or whatever, they don't have the stability of knowing how long they're gonna be in that house. Exactly right. So the, a, lot of, a lot of military kids, they don't want to bother putting up posters. They don't want to decorate their rooms because they're just going to have to take it all down, you know, and they don't know when, but they know it'll be happening. Okay. School, let's look, how about educationally, academically? What are the challenges that you can think of? Um, well, m more recently, curriculum was an issue. Um, when I was on Fort Riley, I saw a lot of I was in a fifth grade classroom and I saw a lot of students come in and out and mostly when students came in, they weren't on the same level. So you get some that are way above grade level or knew way more material and then some who knew nothing that right. the kids were learning. And there was that issue that the teacher was having where um, she had to basically pay play catch up with some of the students because of the states they came from and the things that they didn't learn. Right. She, you know, the comment of, of having sometimes students will come in, you said the students came in and out of your classroom and that, that revolving door in a classroom is something if you're in a military connected school that you will find as a teacher very challenging. The elementary schools on Fort Riley, um, where elementary? Um, That's where I was. Where, okay. 50% yeah. turnover rate during the school year. Yeah, I saw three students leave and two yeah. come in. in during August the year. school year. So half of who started on, in August is a different half. There's a different half when they finish at the end of May. Okay, um, the, the gap too, curriculum. As we, we mentioned, as Common Core standards start to be adopted by different states, the Department of Defense schools have also adopted. So our military kids overseas will also be using the Common Core standards. So as states start to implement those and teachers in the classroom then also start to change their curriculum um, to align with those standards, and, and they should do it pretty quickly because once the testing, the pressure of 
the new testing being aligned with the new standards. There's, that, that kind of puts uh, a pressure on, on you as teachers to, to make those changes quickly. But it's still going to be a few years before it's caught up um, because students are not always at the same level. And because sometimes simply as, as simple as content that doesn't always have to be taught in the same order. Even if it's taught in the same grade, even with Common Core, here's your third grade standards. But that doesn't mean you have to teach telling time on that clock in August or September in your class in, in this state. But in another state, you might wait and, and teach the telling the clock on the time until February, just because that's where it fit better in your timeline. And if the child was in the school <laughs> that was going to learn it in February and moves over Christmas to the school that learned it back in September, they've missed that critical skill. And it, it, in something like that, the, especially these digital world we live in, it can be years before you even realize they don't know that skill. Right? <laughs> All right. Children are often separated from extended families. Um, sometimes kids, we have dual military families, and there, and there are families that both parents deploy at the same time. And the, parent, and the kids go live with grandma or aunt or neighbor. I took, we had a, a, a friend who was a single mom and dad was not in the picture. And the daughter was going to be a senior in high school and the mom had to deploy for a year. She said, what am I gonna do? She said, she doesn't even know her dad and it's gonna be her senior year. So we, my boys were younger then. We bunked the boys together and we gave her a bedroom and she moved, literally moved across the street and lived with us for a year. So, so, so here's, here's this, it, it was, and it worked out well. She had been babysitting my boys for the two years prior, so it kind of worked out that we already knew her pretty well. But it, you know, how weird now thinking back, that, I didn't even, I hadn't even considered how, how much of a transition and struggle that was. She did well and she's graduated from college, helped her get in college and move into her dorm, and, and she's a nurse now and um, with her own family. So, but what a struggle that was, and I reflect back now and, and think of what she went through um, that I didn't necessarily even realize um, was happening to her <laughs> when, we, when she lived with us. There's also social, there's, there's, there's something called a deployment cycle. And there's social emotional effects that go with and there's a, in your handout, you'll see, I've actually laid them out for you, the stages. And anticipation of departure, the first one, well, it's, not, it's the first one on your handout. This is when our family members um, find out the service member is going to deploy. And it's, I kind of equated a little bit to that. You remember back when you first found out you were leaving for college? You got accepted and you were going. Was there kind of an anxiousness on the parents' part? <laughs> okay, maybe a little on your part too. And those first few weeks that you first get here and you move into your dorm, or most people live in dorms their first year, I guess, but unless they live local. Um, but what happened in the family? What was happening at home the week or so before you left? Yeah? <laughs> well, I have a little brother, and he's... Um, nine and a half years younger than me, almost 10. So for him, it was kind of really hard um, to be home alone. Okay. And he cried a lot and called me almost every day because he was used to the routine of having me home after school. And right. he kind of had to do a lot of growing up. And that is exactly the same type of social emotional stuff that military kids go through when their parents leave. Okay. There's also right before a departure, there's, there's sometimes you get, you get kind of, I don't know, walls start to build up emotionally. You might even get into more arguments than normal and you're like, I wish I could just leave now. Or <laughs> would you just hurry up and go because you, know, you can get done with this and get over with it. And sometimes you might feel like that after summer break. <laughs> you're ready to get back to school, right, after you've been gone for a while. And, and so but we do that to protect ourselves emotionally. We kind of build up walls um, as, as somebody is getting ready to leave because of the, the, when that reality sinks in. Stage, oh, and there it is. Of course, I have them out of order, <coughs> sorry. Um, the next one is attachment and withdrawal. Right before they leave, um, they, people will start to withdraw from each other. And, and like I said, start to even build those walls even higher. 
this is this is the time we're hoping to try we being the army family program side of the house which i also am involved with we try to train our parents our military folks if you have kids talk to your teachers communicate but teachers i'm telling you as future teachers talk to your parents if you know you have military parents start to build a relationship with them you should be doing this anyways right with all of your parents from the beginning of the school year and you'll know who's military and who's not and if you start to see changes in the child's behavior you can say hey what's going on or you know is something going on it may not be a deployment they may not think to tell you um, because deployments are not just to war zones. Deployments, they call a deployment is also to a training exercise. They may just be going to California for a month out to the National Training Center. But to that child, it's no different. That parent has left. And they, you know, they don't have a real good handle on span of time. And you can say it's only for a month, and that doesn't always mean concretely what we expect a month to be and can under, and handle that. So ask, sharing information and, and building relationships with your parents from the beginning of the school year is always what we encourage teachers to do. And it, even more so um, important when you know there's, there could potentially be big family changes. Okay, What happens right when a parent leaves or right when a big change happens? Maybe it's a move. Maybe you have a great, your class is just humming. You have your own classroom. It's great. Everything's going well. And Susie, who's one of your, maybe the more popular girls in the school classroom, and she's got lots of friends. And all of a sudden, she's gone. And she's not coming back because she moved. What does that do to the rest of your class? Anything? Does it affect your classroom? What do you do as a teacher to help those students? So, yes. Well, you could like talk about where she was going, like maybe send letters or something like that. Perfect. So you still feel connected. Exactly. Build it right into your curriculum activities that help your students feel connected. If you have a heads up, and you don't always, but if you have a heads up that a student's leaving, you can do a little special something. You can. Um, one of, one of my favorite easy ones is, is you take a, the black stones that you can buy at the dollar store, a dollar for a whole bag of them, and a silver sharpie, and you write the name of your class, third grade. What's your name? Courtney. Courtney. Miss Courtney's, whatever your, you know, your, teacher's name, your teacher name is, but Miss Courtney's class, third grade. And you pass the stone around. You say, Susie is leaving. Today's her last day. Let's all <coughs> press a memory into her memory rock, and you pass the rock around. And kids press the memory, and she and she puts it in her pocket. If you don't write on it, the parent will probably throw it away. Just, more, just telling you, <laughs> if it looks just like a rock, so so label it so they have that memory. Easy, cheap, doesn't have to be expensive, doesn't have to take a huge amount of your time, doesn't have to be a big emotional scene. Okay, it's just a little thing to help kids stay connected. You can make stars um, with your die cut machines, the Ellison. Cut out stars, have all the kids' names on it. As kids move away, they can put a star on the board. Um, or you can have stars from the beginning with everybody's and you leave the kids. Don't, don't when, when your student moves away, like all this lovely artwork back here of all these different faces, you know, don't, don't strip that child away from your room. Don't, you know, start ripping stuff off and, you know, I mean, some things you may have to turn over because you're going to have to turn over cubbies because you're going to probably have another student coming in. But, but, but there's some things you can leave, okay, so you don't have to strip them completely away. This emotional disorganization, you'll see this in your kids after, after a big change and you may have experienced this yourself after a big transition or a change and you're kind of like not sure which way to turn or which way to start on something. Uh, if anybody had a traumatic experience happen and they're kind of got stopped and they were like, they didn't know which, what to do first, or where to turn, maybe you had a car accident, maybe you had to leave somebody, maybe you moved into the dorm the first time, left home for the first time. And if you could think, think about something, you may be able to identify with that kind of emotional disorganization. Um, the spouse, the parent that's left behind also goes through this. And so sometimes they're not as available to the kids right away. And if that parent who left, deployed, was the one who took the child to their team events or club events, was the scout leader or something like that, 
that, that builds a void. So you want to um, be respectful of the kid and, and as they go through this emotional disorganization and just have a conversation with them. Yes? Um, I have a question, and this might be um, not a dumb question, but I just, I honestly don't know because I don't have close family members um, in my inner circle that are military, but what happens, um, not what happens, does the, is there any support um, when both parents are deployed for the, the children? Like, is there a program or? If they live in, the, there are programs both active and National Guard and reserves. Okay. Now the national, the active duty programs are a lot more accessible and ongoing because of the infrastructure of having a military installation, but the National Guard and reserves also have family programs. Okay. They're just more intermittent, like maybe once a month or, or every couple months. There's also camps for, pro for kids whose parents are deployed um, during the summer, especially there's programs. And so there are, there is support out there and the, and the caregivers that are left with the, the children are given, um, there is a family programs program <laughs> that provides resource information okay. on all of those opportunities. I'm just curious because, you know, um, I know with some of my family members, they've had to move from state to state. And if you don't have anyone that lives in state that can take care of it, just... it is difficult. And that's part of the subculture that when a military family moves in and if they're moving on post, especially, I will tell you, I've had this happen when my kids were little. The truck pulls up with the household goods. We pull up in our vehicle to meet the truck to unload everything into the house. Well, the movers unloaded into the house. <laughs> and I'm, I get out of the car and I've got two little kids with me. The neighbors come out of the woodwork on post. A different, another piece of this subculture. Hey, I've got, I've got boys your age. Do your boys want to come over and play? while you deal with the movers. And you're like, sure. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't necessarily do that in a civilian community where you showed up and somebody, you know. So our family's been lucky enough. We have almost always lived on the military installation. It's not always available because of waiting times and different situations. And housing on post is only designed to house 30% of the families um, that are stationed there. So. So you don't always have that opportunity, but we've kind of moved in weird cycles and times that, that have made it available. If, if you move at the height of the moving, like in July, it's, that's tough to get a house sometimes. All right, um, the next one, and, and, and as you can imagine, kids are gonna worry. Luckily the news, you know, we try to keep the news, you try to keep parent, as parents, they try to keep the news away from the kids. And it's not so much now, it's all politics on the news. But back when this conflict started in 2003, 2004, 2005 still, I mean, I know it started earlier than that, but it's three, four, and five, I can vividly remember, because my husband was, was gone in five in, um, in Iraq, and he, and, and the news was 24-7, 24-7 war, and that was, horrible for the kids. They've gotten better about that. Um, unfortunately, they almost swung the other way it, to the extent that you don't hear anything about it right now. And if and all you watch the news, all you know about is, is health care and, and such. So you don't, you're not even hearing what's happening overseas. So, but, but at least it's better for our kids. And you can see, look at this poor little guy. He is a happy little dude normally. But here we are at Easter. Dad was deployed and he was not happy that dad wasn't there. Um, sometimes you're gonna have, kids are going to have trouble sleeping, they're going to have less energy. And what happens to your students when they don't sleep? What can't they do in your classroom? They can't focus, they can't learn. You, sleep is just critical. All right. So a few weeks after, after that parent's gone, you start to have kind of a, um, a stabilization. Every family gets in a new battle rhythm and they, and they kind of start to normalize. Um, and, and, and things seem normal again to some extent, for most kids, okay? Now it's time for mom or dad to come home. What if you got a particularly squirrely kid whose mom has, and you, whose mom for the last nine months, 12 months, whichever it is, has said, you wait till your dad gets home. You wait till your dad gets home. You wait till your dad gets home. Hey, guess what? Dad's coming home. Let's make him a banner. <laughs> and the kid's going, 
uh oh, <laughs> dad's coming home. I've been threatened for not, and we hope our parents aren't doing that, but we know some do, just because it's, it's just, it is what it is, right? So there are sometimes very mixed emotions that it's this happy time, but then it's just this, well, wait a minute, I've been doing, I've, I've grown up for a year. Both my boys, I taught both my boys to drive. Both of them were 15 during a deployment. They're four years apart. Both of them were 15 during their deployment, so I taught them to drive. Dad came home. When he left, they were 14. He came home, and they're driving his truck, and he's like, whoa, <laughs> what is this? He didn't like driving at all because he had been back a few ba years back in, in 2005. Um, the IDs and driving was very, I don't know, you said, were you deployed? Mm -hmm. it, what year were you gone? 05, 06. There you go. Uh, so you know, yeah. driving, they don't even let soldiers drive for the first 24, 36 hours when they get back after a deployment because they haven't been driving for so long. And when they were out on patrols, everything from a dead dog on the side of the road could be a potential bomb. So there's, everything is, they're on high alert. Mm -hmm. And so my, all of a sudden, now they've got this kid driving him, it was, it was very difficult. And they were afraid Dad, he was, Dad wasn't going to let them drive. And it was a challenge. And he had to kind of work through that. He did better with the second kid when it happened again. <laughs> um, and so this, this, this cycle, now you have this readjustment period. And there's a little honeymoon period. But then after about 30, 60, 90 days, we start to see kind of a 30, 60, 90 day cycle of adjustments. And when we start to really see problems is coming in that 60 to 90 day period is where you're going to end up um, families, if they haven't been able to readjust, you may, you may start seeing higher levels of abuse, um, domestic abuse, child abuse, and, um, or divorce. The rates kind of rise during that time period. If you get past that, often they work it out. And, and there's so many supports and helps and can't, mental health um, opportunities for family members and service members that we really encourage them. And it's not, it's all confidential and it doesn't hurt their career and all that other stuff. They've really worked hard in the military to, to ensure that families know that, service members know that. Um, so where, where might your kids disappear from the classroom? So mom or dad come home and they're back and they're, they're reintegration and now your kid's a little squirrely because mom or dad's home and things are a little different at the house. And three weeks later, the kid disappears for two weeks. He's gone to Disney World. <laughs> he is, it's called block leave. Because when a unit comes back from a deployment, they let everybody come back and get reset a little bit, go through mental health checks, turn in equipment, kind of get their feet on the ground, and then they send the whole unit on leave as a block. Because if half the unit goes, the other half can't do their jobs because half the other guys are gone or guys or girls are gone, okay? So the whole unit goes, and when they go, they usually have a two-week block of time. Sometimes it's, they've, if they've been gone a year, they've earned a month, but usually the unit will do it in two-week blocks. So your students may disappear. How is that okay as a teacher? What does that do to your class in your classroom? Maybe not the other kids, but what does it do to you as a teacher and that student as your student? It's unfair to them. It's what? It puts them behind. It'll put them behind. So what, what can you do as a teacher to help facilitate that not, hap not getting behind? Communicate with the, the parents so that you know when they are leaving. Yes. You, that way you can either send them what work to do while they're gone. Absolutely. If, again, it came right back to that communication and the, and the, and the relationships you have with the parents and, and putting work together. Um, so when you know a kid says their, their parents come back, start thinking in your own heads, hey, this kid, in a few weeks, this kid may be leaving my class for about two weeks. Reach out to the parent that you have the relationship with and say, hey, you know, I heard your, your family's back together after the deployment. That's great news. Are you anticipating going on block leave? Because you need to start preparing as a teacher. So try to, try to jump the gun on that and get ahead, ahead of the situation, OK? I will tell you that block leave sometimes is a lot of time together. After you've been apart for a year, <laughs> to have two weeks of vacation together is a lot of together time. <laughs> All right. Um, I already mentioned the 30, 60, 90 days, the reintegration, the restabilization. It all comes back together. And just when you think everything is stable and normal again, you, get, or you, you find out you're on a patch list, which patch chart, which means your unit's going to deploy again in six months or nine months or a year, or you're going to 
you're finding out you're going to get orders and you're going to move, or you find out the Army's drawing down and they don't need so many of uh, wheel mechanics anymore, or whatever your job, particular job is, and, and you haven't progressed fast enough, so you're, you're, on, you're on the short list to be exited out of the military, okay? And the whole cycle starts over again. All right, so what, what, a great resource. I really, really want you guys to look at this resource. Um, MilitaryKidsConnect.org. This website is for you as a teacher. It is for your students. It is for your parents of your students. It has um, information on pretty much, it can answer pretty much any question. If it doesn't answer it directly, it links you to a source that does about the military, about the deployment cycle, about expected behaviors of children during different situations. It has lesson plans. You mentioned tying it to the curriculum with the child leaving. Maybe they were moving to a different state and you can study about that state or learn something. You can, you can write letters, campaign, yes. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm from Lebanon, so like mm -hmm. Lebanon's sure. close. And a lot, a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of officers there. Mm -hmm. And so how do you deal with parents who wear like their husband's rank or wear their wife's rank or they pull that card because I, my sister-in-law like teaches on post and she gets a lot of that. Well, my husband's a blah, blah, blah. So my, my kid should be able to do this. How do you deal with that? Because yeah. if you are like, if say we have to teach in a military school and I'm not military, I mean, like, right. rank means nothing to me. So right, guess, right. Cause you know, it, Exactly. So how do you how, do you how, how would you that? deal with that with any parent who comes in with a sense of entitlement for their right. child? And you're going to run into that regardless whether they're military mm -hmm. and the rank thing or, um, I mean, I've met plenty of civilians in the world too who right. there's just some people who feel like they have this sense of entitlement that their kid should get well, something bigger, better. So how do you deal with that? Any, any ideas? And the kids can be like that too. Like, Sometimes, oh, yeah. sometimes it's getting better. I've seen it over my, I've been a teacher for 26 years and I've taught on military, with military connected mm -hmm. kids for, for many of those. And I have seen a better trend that there's <coughs> less of that with the kids um, and also less of it with the spouses. Now it's, uh, than it used to be. Mm -hmm. So that's a good, a good note. So I mean, you just have that convers a frank conversation and say, all of my students are treated equally and fairly in my classroom, and this is here is here was the criteria to meet to do whatever it is you know you, you wanted them to do. And I'm so, I'm sorry that little whoever give me a kid's name Johnny Johnny Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, little Johnny. Little Johnny didn't make the criteria, but here's what he needs to do next time. So he can participate or can be part of it. And you just you need to just be fair to all of your kids, you know, and, and explain to them um, that you're sorry that, you know, all your kids in your class are, are equal in your eyes and they have, here are the standards, here are the expectations, and they either meet them or we, you know, or, or they try to meet them and we help them get there. And here are some suggestions to do that. All right. Also on here you find, you see the bottom left, it says lesson plans. All sorts of lesson plans for social studies, for English, for math, all connected with military stuff. Where kids have come from, writing, letter writing campaigns to service members or to friends who have moved from the classroom. Um, there, there was a, there's PE lessons. There were all sorts of uh, different games from different countries. There was a lesson plan in here that explained um, kind of a, a running, I want to say it was kind of like a capture the flag game, but it was similar, but it was a game that the children in Afghanistan play, so you can learn about different cultures and, and by doing things like that. So um, great website for, for educators, for students, and for parents as well. There's different sections. I just have a screenshot of the teacher's piece here, and it links out to all sorts of, tells you when I, when I screenshot this, it was 70 degrees in Afghanistan. <laughs> all right. Um, so how can you build resiliency with your kids in your class? What can you do to help your kids be stronger and more resilient? And this isn't just military kids. Because remember, military kids are skilled kids. We want to build resiliency for all the kids in our class. So 
as a classroom teacher, this resiliency wheel, and I have a picture of it on there, and it's actually in your, on the page that, of your handout that has the QR codes. I'll point out which one is the wheel to you. So you're, because it's, it's the one with the little pyramid of children that says studentsfirstproject.org. And the, and the website, the URL is written out there for you as well. Or you can use the QR code. And that takes you out to this wheel. And on this wheel, each of these sections are hyperlinked to strategies that you can use in the classroom, which I've also provided for you in your handout. So what do you do um, to help your children increase, to set, to set clear and consistent boundaries, I should say? Let's start at the top. What can you do as a teacher? What do you do in a, as a classroom teacher to set clear and consistent boundaries for your students? I think um, behavior and expectations are clearly stated and uh, brought forth to the students as soon as possible. Um, okay. Knowing, I think it's in, in, important for students to know what what is expected of them, what they need to be, you know, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate. Right. Um, so what, clear expectations. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So class rules, clear expectations, yes? I just went along with that, especially with elementary students. Um, visuals would be good, like having either the rules on like a poster or like a drawing of something that's like good or bad, or um, that would just help them out, rather than just being like, okay, these are the rules one time and then right. addressing them later. Right, because we, as we know, elementary kids aren't going to remember what what the class rules are off the top of their head at a moment when they are misbehaving and their brain is not <laughs> function firing in the way it should and filtering. Um, I think it's a good idea to model like those oh, rules for them perfect. because they'll, I mean, if they see you doing it, they're going to Modeling the rules as a, cl <coughs> as a classroom teacher <coughs> is key. If they see you being disrespectful or um, sarcastic or making fun of somebody or rolling your eyes about something, why wouldn't they do it, right? You have to, you have to be in um, a good role model because, boy, those little people are watching everything you do. And not just in the classroom. They see you in the hallways. They see you in the lunchroom. They may see you at Walmart, right? Yeah. It's, uh, and it's funny. Have, have, have any of you gotten to know any students yet well enough and then see them in the community? <laughs> and they're like, hey! <laughs> They think you live in the school. So yeah. for them to see you outside of the school is it's kind of neat. Um, what about what about life skills? As a teacher, what life skills are you teaching your students? Sharing. Like hard work, doing all your homework on time and responsibility. Personal responsibility. I heard sharing. Sharing. Sharing and caring. Okay? Great life skills. As adults, what are like the two best life skills to have? Perseverance. Perseverance, personal responsibility, and share, be sharing and caring. I mean, right there. Nice. You know the old book that says everything you need to know you learned in kindergarten? <laughs> kind of holds true. <laughs> All right? And, and that leads us right to the next one, which is providing caring and support. And that's what you're modeling through that, that role modeling you mentioned. And the sharing and the caring, you're modeling to them that a healthy a child-adult relationship. You may be, as their classroom teacher, the most stable thing in their life during certain times of transition. And that goes for all kids, not just military kids. And you may be the most stable, at the moment, adult relationship they have. So being able to provide, show that caring and support is so important. Setting, somebody already mentioned, setting high expectations. What about that poor kid who's, oh, his dad's deployed. So we should feel sorry for him. He shouldn't have to do his homework, right? No. Yeah, feel bad, but he should also do his homework. That doesn't mean you don't accommodate. Yeah. Don't lower your expectations. Accommodate how the work is completed, if necessary. Maybe it's a little bit longer um, time when it's due in. Because the child stayed up because the plane, dad's plane came in or mom's plane came in at 3 o'clock in the morning. And the child was 
in the gymnasium, as you saw in that picture earlier, waiting. And so they didn't sleep last night. And they were excited, and they couldn't concentrate to get their homework done. So maybe you accommodate, but that doesn't mean you wash it away. Don't lower the expectations. Just accommodate as necessary um, to help the child be successful. Okay? Uh, providing meaningful opportunities. How do you do that as a classroom teacher for your students? Yes? Would it be like assigning them roles in the classroom? Assigning them roles in the classroom is a perfect, perfect example. Um, when somebody has a purpose, they're going to be more resilient. When they feel like they make a difference, they're going to be more resilient. And that goes for all people. Think back in the old days, maybe you've seen it, because you're all kind of young, <laughs> the old-fashioned nursing homes. People, old people would get put in the nursing home, they sat in a bed, and they didn't usually live too long. Now, what, are they, what, what do we have for, for older generation instead of just going straight to the nursing home? Nice. They have events. They have the assisted living care centers where, yes, there's still nursing staff, and yes, there's still people looking out, and there might be people still cooking meals for them, but there's events. They get to choose their meals. They get to choose their events. They have, they have choice. They have autonomy. They have some control in their life, and they have a purpose of something to do. And that is, we all need that as human beings. And so providing that as a teacher for your students is going to increase the resiliency of all the kids in your class. Um, increasing pro-social bonding. This is where you're going to provide opportunities for your kids to engage with each other and build relationships with each other. So what do you do in a classroom, as a classroom teacher, what do you do to help increase the social connections amongst your own students? I think it's uh, making it important to like learn about each other, I okay. guess. And so that way they can connect with what they like and who they are, I okay. guess. So like find similarities within students and then they can kind of connect on that basis because if they don't know each other, they're not gonna connect with each other. Exactly. Okay, so we find similarities. What are some other things? So now we've got similarities, and all of you like um, camouflage, I'm gonna, or hats. I'm going to call y'all hats. Y'all are hats, people. And all of y'all over here, I don't know what you liked. You liked uh, purple. Um, probably not a stretch, right? <laughs> okay, and so you're all together, and we're halfway through the school year. And you're still over here, the hat people, and the purple people are still over here, and these groups are still over here. Have we built many connections? Mm -hmm. Not too many. So what can you do? What do you do? What strategies do you use as a classroom teacher to help build relationships and connections in the classroom? Cooperative learning. Cooperative learning. Yay! <laughs> it is really important. It's not just a great teaching strategy academically, but it is a teaching strategy in the sense of the pro-social bonding opportunities for your kids to make new connections. And the more connections they have, the more resilient they're going to be. Um, you'll see in your handouts there's seven, seven C's listed of resiliency. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of squeezed in right before the um, QR codes. Competence, confidence, connections, character, contribution, coping, and control. These seven C's of resiliency, you can see right where the, they would fit into um, every piece of the pie on this resiliency wheel as well. And teaching kids um, how to, or giving them opportunities to have a purpose, to make connections, to make friends, and role modeling that. They're gonna, like I said, they're watching you in the hallway too. So when you're talking with other teachers, you want, we all need, as teachers, you all need that opportunity to debrief, <laughs> de-escalate. Maybe you've had a rough day in class, maybe, okay? Just make sure it's not where any other student can see you because then you're not providing that role model. Mm -hmm. You go privately in the teacher's lounge and you're like, holy <coughs> man, this was a day, <laughs> right? Perfectly normal, we need to do that. Just make sure it's never in earshot or eye shot of your students, okay? Because it does not provide a good role model for them. Um, or if something does happen, 
use some appropriate techniques. You're like, if something bad happens in class, maybe a child choked on something, and you're over it, and everything happens, and you can come back and you say, wow, that really scared me. Did it, did it scare you? I mean, and, sh and kind of talk them through the appropriate way to respond to something um, as well as you're training them and helping them and building their own resiliency. This, this website, like I said, is another great one to, to link to. So check that out. Um, the link's on your, your handout. So what about, y'all? everybody in here is going to be an elementary teacher in this particular group. But literacy isn't just for elementary, is it? Literacy is for all grades. So um, regardless of, uh, of what, what grade level you're going to teach to, there are materials out there you can use. I brought some in here. I actually put some books on your table. It's called The Little Champs. Um, it's a fairly new. It's only been out about a year. Children's book about five military kids and the challenges they go through. And it's a fun little story. Um, every kid is a different service of the branch. So it's the most joint installation you'll ever um, find. But even though there are um, installations that do have at least one or two, a few people from each branch on them. Not many, but a few do. But these kids all have different challenges. One child's parent was wounded, another one's moving, another one's retiring, another one's getting left behind. And they talk about the traits. They go and they, they talk to their parents and find out what are the, the character traits about themselves that, they, um, that help them be a strong military kid. And, and they talk about perseverance, which I heard somebody say, and trust, and unity, and flexibility, and all those things. So this is a neat little book. And as you go through it, um, the kids use kind of military jargon, jargon, whatever, military speak. And the, that guarded vocabulary is actually defined for you on the pages that it's listed, which is kind of neat. So this book is designed not only to be used with military kids to understand there are other kids who go through challenges and some ways to help deal with them, but also to help train civilian kids about the military child and some of the challenges they go through, as well as in, in just in general resiliency and good character traits. Um, that come along with, with being a strong, resilient child in general. So it's kind of a neat book. We've, I'm part of the, the program that's developing a curricular um, supplement to go along with it in uh, music, <coughs> in PE, in social studies, math, and English um, that go with, go with the book. And we'll have that up on our website. The, the bookmark I passed out to you has a QR code on it. As well, it takes you to this URL, which is actually our own College of Ed's website. And this one will take you directly to the, the military initiatives page where we're going to have, uh, and we already have some, our, our video or documentary, which most of you have had the opportunity to see, and is linked there, as well as resources and the curriculum material for, for this book and some other things um, that will be helpful to you. And, a whole annotated list that Dr. Curtis and I worked on of children's literature um, that in what the grade level and, and a little bit about the book that you can um, access and use in your own classrooms um, someday. So, so keep that in your resources as well. The clicker is right here. So using children's literature about military kids, and actually there's some books here. Here's a little novel for, for a little bit older kids. There's a novel about these kids. It's a little mystery novel, kind of along the, the old Nancy Drew Hardy Boys, but updated. But these are military kids on Fort Benning, Georgia. Um, and their story of their little adventures, very much like the, the um, like I said, the Nancy Drew books. This is um, Sandra Linhart, who's actually, I actually know her. We were stationed at Fort Benning together many, many years in 2005, so for many years, eight years ago. Um, and so that was neat to see uh, her books were being published because she was working on those when we were there and it's actually come to fruition. So stories provide a chance. We also, look, look if you're in an area with, it, with military in the area, look for opportunities to pair up. Here we had some, this is Bergman Elementary this last, um, last year. And with um, your KD Pi? No, that's a sorority. Which is the, the academic one? Yes, KDP. KDP. It is. It's KDP. Okay. Um, they have their Literacy Alive program. So what we did for their Literacy Alive last semester, we 
had some soldiers come in, actually read a little champs book and do activities with the kids. So look for those opportunities to pair up with actual military service members. Maybe they're the parents of your children or maybe they're not. Maybe these guys had no connections to that school whatsoever other than their unit is assigned to um, support the school in, in different ways. Okay, I told you about the little champs book. Other opportunities is tell me a story program if you're around a military installation, they have family programs a couple times a year where a guest reader reads a book and all the families that attend get a copy of the book, but then they have breakout sessions and have small group discussions around a book. And that's a neat idea for you as a classroom teacher is you, when you read a book in your classroom, come up with some discussion questions and send them home and have the kid talk to the parent about the book. Extend that book beyond um, just the, being able to decode the words and, and answer questions directly. A neat program. So if you're ever around, we have one coming up in November on uh, Fort Riley um, with the book called Giraffes Can Dance. It is the cutest book. So if you're early, early childhood literature, not early childhood, pre-K, but young in literature, it's, it is a fun book. And uh, the general and his wife will be reading it, and they're fun people. Um, great parents, so it's going to be neat to watch. And she's an educator herself. So Some of the books that are listed, I said, on the website, on our College of Ed website, we have a whole annotated list. This is just a brief, and, and it's not too hard, and these are some of the ones I have listed here. Like, but what if, and what if, um, what if daddy doesn't remember what I look like, you know, for your young people. So these are written for your, your elementary age. Um, and some other things, bulletin boards, you mentioned that. Maybe, may, oh, here's great. If you have a parent who's deployed or gone for a while, ask the parent if they want to collect the child's work and put together a care package to send to the parent. They, um, I know I've taught, have friends who've, who's, um, when they were deployed, they love getting their kids' artwork and some of their kids' papers and things like that. So, you know, you all create this plethora of paperwork, <laughs> papers, <laughs> for little people <laughs> in elementary school. And you just don't know always what to do with all of it. But this is a great, a great way um, to send it in care packages. And um, also to help families build portfolios. Because when they move, if they can take a sample of their child's work, it makes that gaining teacher have that much of a better understanding off of that if that parent can walk in and say, here's what my child's been doing. So keeping portfolios as a teacher is a, is a great tool as well to serve them. Um, and we already talked about the quick, meaningful ways of goodbye. The rock was one way. Taking a piece of poster paper with cut out arms glued on each side. And it can be a hug card so the arms fold across it. And have all the kids sign it, something easy. Doesn't cost you anything. It's construction paper. Um, and you can do it, you can do it on the fly. <laughs> The kid comes in and says, today's my last day. You could have that whipped up in, in just minutes. Um, those, the protocol for gaining students, I think, is important for you to be aware of. You need to have some quick assessments to see where that child is, math, and their math, and their reading, et cetera. Ask the parent if they have samples of their work. A lot of parents keep that stuff anyways. <laughs> You know, um, so ask them if they have samples of the work that will help. Have materials, have a set of materials ready at any given time, too. Um, you know, there's nothing like if, if we had a student came in now and you all are filled, and I'm like, oh, well, we, we're not letting anybody sit here, so here, let me, let me set this up for you over here. Here, I'll just push this out of the way, and here, new student, oh, new student, come in, new student. And you, were, you had timing like you wouldn't believe. Come in, new student. Just kidding. Play along. <laughs> yeah, it's so welcome. <laughs> we, we don't have any other seats available for you right now, new students, so if you'll sit right here. Okay, how, how is she? See how she feels? Oh, yeah. Of course she's confused, too. But can you imagine as a new student how that would feel? that you're this extra person, that you don't have a cubby like everybody else, you don't have the same books. Oh, well, you know, I don't even have a book for you, so can you, okay, can you share, maybe we can borrow, oh, let's just let you share my book, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay, and so they're dazed and confused, and they're already feeling like an outsider before they've even gotten started. So, thank you, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Boy, I couldn't have planned that. 
Um, it was awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but so you see how important it would be to be prepared for a new student to come into your classroom, and they literally will walk in just like that. The principal will show up with a child and say, "Here's your new student." Okay, and it may not be before school. And you think, well, geez, why doesn't the parent just take the kid home, let me get ready today, and bring him back tomorrow? Remember the moving truck? <laughs> okay, they may be in a situation where the kid would go home and sit in a hotel room the rest of the day, or be in the, it'd be, not be attended to because they're being moved in and unpacked and all of the other stuff. So sometimes the best stable place for that child is to go into a new school. I'll tell you, when we moved this summer, my family moved, my son and I, still kind of feeling this new house and unpacking and, and getting, getting settled in the new installation. And I had learned new, new roads and some of a bunch of one-way roads on that installation. And we're like, OK, we're hungry. Let's go get something to eat. We walked into the PX. Does anybody know what, who can tell us what a PX is? It's the grocery store. It's the, and, well, yeah, and the, it's like the mall on post, yeah. OK? There's like a Walmart on post oh, and a grocery a store on post called Commissary, mm -hmm. right. So we walk into PX, and like any good mall, it has a food court. <laughs> and 85% of the food things are the same pretty much anywhere you go. There's almost always a Charlie Subs. There's almost always an Anthony's Pizza. There's almost always a Burger King. And so my son and I, we, we've been unpacking and trying to figure out our way around this new post. And we walked into the PX, into, and you walk into the food court, and we both went, because it was normal. And that's the way kids feel walking into a classroom. School is normal for them. So you're part of that stability. So be, bear with uh, the, the, the last minute showing up child. Um, do the best you can. Morning meetings are important. Routines are really important for your classroom. I know you're hearing about that just in, in your own elementary ed, just in general. But routines add to some of that stability. Clear management plans for kids who are absent and how you're going to handle that. And what about, look at this picture. Would that concern you as a teacher? That if a child in your class drew that? No. No. Especially with military kids. That's normal to them. They're climbing on tanks. They're playing with equipment. They're seeing it in, in where they live. And this was a birthday card that a little boy wrote to his aunt. A little boy named Wolfgang. He wrote it to Aunt Christiane. Wolfgang. Yeah, Wolfgang. <laughs> and uh, I see happy birthdays coming, being shot out of the tanks there as it's being bombed. <laughs> okay. Not a disturbed child. Not a bad picture. No malice in, in any way. Okay. So be just um, be aware that that's. That's kind of normal, and it's not. So your reaction to the guns is something to be concerned, be aware. Of. Another resource, this supporting students and military families. We have this book available to you. It's um, a great book. You can actually get it for free um, online right now from tcpress.com/slash/militaryfamiliesoffer. You can go on there, and they will send you that book for free. Teachers, not a bad thing. Otherwise, I paid 26 bucks for mine. So. Um, I can give you that website if you didn't get it written down. It's tcpress.com slash military families offers. Offer. Military families offer. Got HTML. Okay. okay. The responsive classroom, it's Dr. Curtis talked to you about this this program. This is another one of those morning routine programs. Really great about having a um, a stable routine in your classroom, responsiveclassroom.org. It helps get the going in the beginning of the school year. Um, and she highly recommends it. Okay. And then I already gave you that's the bookmark website. And to in lieu of if anything I haven't answered or questions. I thank you for your attention. You cannot keep the books. But I will tell you that the book is, um, the set of books is available here in the College of Ed to be checked out if you want to use them for anything. You can even check a whole classroom set out. Cool. Okay? Thank you so much. Great. Thank you.